so welcome everyone. Good to see you. Uh, this is the ninth Learning Lab session for whom it's the first time. It's part of the WISH EU project, uh, which is a project funded by the European Commission. And the goal is to create and write European rules on detention houses and also to write European guidelines on relational security. So what it means to actually work uh, in a small scale detention facilities. Um, and today we have Doreen Murisan. He's an international expert on staff training. He has trained staff all over the world. It's very impressive. Uh, and he's been working within the criminal justice system for more than 30 years. So welcome, Doreen. Um, before I give you the floor, uh, I will ask everyone to just briefly mention their names, where they're from and uh, for where they work. Um, okay, like we always do. So you, Doreen, also know who is present and uh, people can also contact each other. Okay, um, Manu. Good morning, everyone. I'm a Belgian criminal criminologist and I work for Reskills. So nice to meet you all. Petra? Uh, I am Petra Kolpert. I am uh, the uh, director of the first detention house in Belgium. So we are um, having 57, uh, we have place for 57 uh, male um, males and we will uh, open a first uh, house for females as well. Isabel? Hello, everybody. So I'm Isabelle Leroux. I'm an associate professor at Angers University uh, in France. Laura? Hello, everyone. I'm Laura, and I'm doing an internship at the moment at Elizabeth? Good morning, my name is Elisabeth. I'm a criminologist as well, and I teach in the um, uh, Vives uh, College in Kortrijk. Pascal? Good morning, everybody. My name is Pascal Descartes. I'm a French criminologist. I work as a scientific employee at the, Nation the German National Prevention Mechanism Against Torture. I only speak on my name today and just one uh, story last, last week we visited a prison in Germany and they will open a new prison in the southeast of Germany next year with 100, 820 prisoners, 820 places. So we still have a lot of, of work to do. So cool. oh, that's why this, this lab is very important. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Hugo? Hello, my name is Hugo, and I'm an intern for Reskilled in the Netherlands. Janika? Hi, good morning. I am Janika, forensic psychology practitioner I'm from Malta. I came from Rice Foundation. We offer a rehabilitation and reintegration program in the community, like a sort of a halfway house for inmates. Thank you. Connor? Hi, I'm Connor. I'm the European Program Manager for Rescales, uh, and I'm based in Luxembourg. Sarah? Hi, I'm Sara. I'm from Portugal, and I'm a Project Manager in Advocacy for Reshape. I'm a criminologist as well. Mark? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, the name is Mark Schneider from France. I'm coordinating the WISH program for France. Oh, by the way, just to let you know, Mario Dill has an unexpected problem this morning. She may be uh, late. Carla? Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Carla Ishi. I work with Sara. I'm also uh, the advocacy project manager at Reshape, a Portuguese NGO. I am also a lawyer and a researcher at the University of Coimbra. Nice to meet you all. Julia? Hi, it is my first time here. I'm a graduate student uh, based in Italy and I work as an intern for uh, Rescale. Erika? 
Hi, good morning. I too, like Yannicka, work at the Rice Foundation Malta, which is, uh, as Yannicka said, a community-based sanction for rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders. Right now we work mostly with males, but we're going to start working with females too. And I am a criminologist. Thank you. I think I covered everyone. Um, my name is Veronique Aisha and I work for Reskilled Europe, um, had social impact and also for restorative justice Netherlands. Um, okay, Doreen, can I ask you to give the presentation and also maybe short, briefly introduce yourself as you know, can do that better than I can. Okay, so uh, everybody see right now the, pre the slides? Yeah. yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Uh, well, uh, I I used to say that a picture say more, says more than, more than 1,000 words. So um, this is the topic for uh, today's uh, discussion. And in order to introduce myself, in few pictures, this is the story of my life. I graduate uh, the college uh, 33 years ago. Uh, it was uh, quite funny that the college that I graduate uh, was built 150 years ago, two years after the local council took the decision to build a prison in my small town. I live in a small town in Transylvania. And uh, in 1896, the local council took the decision to build the prison. And two years after, they take the decision to build the college. So you see, it's uh, it's quite interesting to see that the main focus was not education, was uh, keeping pe people in custody. It was an old classic Victoria, old style class, old style Victorian type of prison, 100, um, 120 beds. It was uh, transformed uh, during the period of the kingdom in Romania and the communist regime. And what is more uh, uh, funny is that uh, I became the prison governor of that prison. That prison was transformed in a prison hospital. And then I worked there as a prison governor and I succeed to accreditate that prison, uh, that, that hospital as one of the top quality uh, hospitals, not just in the prison service, but also outside. Then I graduate police academy in 1997 uh, at the correctional section. So in Romania, uh, if you want to work uh, as an officer in the prison service, you need to go to the police academy. There is a specific um, um, section for correctional side. Uh, and after you graduate, you have also a, a law degree. So you could work as a lawyer in the justi judicial system in Romania. It, starting 2005, I uh, joined ICPA and uh, international, this is the abbreviation for International Correction and Prison Association. And step by step, I work with, um, with the organization. I Initially, I was a member, then I was a deputy, and now I am the chair of the staff training and development network within this organization. In this position, we provide uh, services free of charge on voluntary basis for our ICPA members. And we are also involved in uh, in the last six years, we are involved, I think, in uh, 10 European projects, in Erasmus Plus projects. And uh, we, did, we did quite a good job in, in, in this field. I also participate at various uh, conferences on behalf of ICPA. And uh, I add also pictures uh, of what I do in my free time. Uh, you will see me on uh, the left side, down left side, uh, as a barbarian. Uh, I, uh, I am a, I'm a member of a reenactment association. And then you will see me in the front of the History Museum uh, National History Museum in Bucharest, delivering a living history uh, class for uh, children uh, from uh, Bucharest uh, from Bucharest uh, colleges. So this is, in a nutshell, some information about me and um, what I like to do in the professional side, but also on my uh, hobby side. Before we start to go on the presentation, I would like to to tell you. A, so, a, a short story. And the story is from Charles Dickens. 
and it's about Charles Dickens, The Tale of Two Cities. Charles Dickens in A Tale of Two Cities opened his classic novel with the words, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolish nation. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We have everything before us, we had nothing before us. We are all going direct to heaven, we are all going direct the other way. All, all the time when I read this, uh, this uh, novel, uh, I find a lot of similarities with what happens right now in the prison services that we work, we interact, or we have programs with. So is there nothing before us in the work in prisons, as opposed to the past that some of us more mature practitioners remember, when we often paved the road while we were traveling on it? Times when we were a part of innovation. 20 years ago, we were a part of innovations. Today, what, what was 20 years ago innovation? Today, it's a common practice. At least in our own minds, we were responsible for those new programs or procedures. We are now in the time of standards to guide our work. We have national standards. We have international standards. We live with written lesson plans for staff training and highly scrutinized standard operation procedure and even post orders. Not only the first line staff, but also top administrators have standardized reports and books of best practices and detailed bureaucratic process for hiring and firing and making the work and the decision more transparent. I believe that we have everything before us in terms of potential new programs. And this, and this project that we are uh subjects of discussions today it's an example of of um of the fact that we have everything before us in the in in prison we will find we soon we will face a new a, an economic crisis and this will will affect very 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 fast and very hard the prison environment because imagine that if you are a politician and if you have 1 million euro to spend and you have to choose between a school, a prison, or a hospital. What do you, what do you will choose? You will choose the prison. I highly doubt it about that. So we need to, to be more aware about the fact that uh, we need to be wise enough and we need to be, uh, and we need to be extremely uh, focused on, um, on using technologies as a support activities in our environment. We are all going direct to heaven. We are all going direct to the other way. The last line of the opening sentence of Dickens in the tale of two cities, it's a bit problematic for me in looking at the reform of prison in time of this, uh, in, in, in time like this. It is always much easier to look out a window uh, at others than to yourself in a mirror. My initial reaction to this thought that we are all going to heaven and we are all going to hell is yes, we are. We are in difficult time, business, that of holding absolute power about the daily life of the others. And before you join, I discuss about with Veronique about the, the burnout and the professional stress of the prison staff. So this is this is one of the, the most stressful uh, the most stressful job. I used to say that in a prison institution, the most powerful staff is not the prison governor, is the wing manager, is the people who hold the key on a on a on a cell of the cells because everything could happen or could not happen in a prison wing if the guy who hold if the guy or the girl who hold the key don't want it but when you have this absolute power about the lives of the others this absolute power come also with a, a lot of professional stress with a lot of with a lot of uh, of uh, of challenges that you need to be and you need to manage so when we say that we are in a difficult business of holding absolute power of the, the daily life of the others, we try to do what is right and fair. Things, things that we should give us points toward acceptance into heaven. We make mistakes. We make mistakes. All the, you know, in, in every day we make mistakes. And those mistakes have negative consequences of our staff, inmates, victims, and the public. So I think we have proof that Saint, what St. Bernard says around 1, uh, 1,150 years ago, 
Hell is full of good intention or wishes, with what in modern times says the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I do not I do know that we move toward the direction of hell when I publicly join the criticism of the prison system or institution or staff member accused of wrongdoing when I have no real idea what the facts are. Well, on the other hand, I think my chance for entrance to heaven might increase when I do voice my concern to the proper authorities when I have knowledge of abuse rather than remaining silent and protecting my peers. I do believe that letting staff to go to work without proper training and supervision regardless of resources, it's wrong. This is why I said that I prefer to work in a 200 or 300 year old prison built in the uh, 200 or 300 years ago, but with a staff which is properly trained to, to manage the 2023 20, realities. De de denying inmates access to visit or education or food or medical care for bureaucratic or financial reason, rather than looking for ways to solve problems should be held against me. These are, these are the expression, uh, these are the things that I believe that we could do in, uh, in, in prison environment. So this is my small opening. I will end also my presentation with, again, quoting from Mr. Charles Dickens, because I find quite inspiring his words um, about the prison environment. So now let's go to 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 the pre, to the topic of the conf, to the topic of our meeting. So I told you that I'm um, I'm involved in um, in ICPA. A short, uh, a short description of the organization. You could find more about ICPA if you, uh, if you look on www.icpa.org. We are, you are kindly invited to participate at a global, a global conference called Human Correction, Belgium, October 2023. Uh, you will find more information about uh, about, about that. Uh, this year, it was a year that uh, we dedicate uh, a lot of involvement in the field of prison technology as a partner and inspiration of correctional and modernization of the prison services um, uh, in uh, in the world. So I hope that some uh, of you, you could come to, to ICPA conference in Antwerp this October. When I was approached by Veronique to discuss about, uh, to discuss about uh, the topic of staff training about, uh, about this project, I was thinking that yes, it's good to discuss about training, but more, a lot of discussions uh, forgot the main issue of this pro of this process. A lot of discussions were focused just on process and ignored the end user, the person which are the subject of the activities. So we the persons that we are discussing, it's the new generation that we had we need to held uh, in our attention. So. We have a new generation in our workforce. So we have at global level, 65 million people born between 20, between 1995 and 2010. With those who are born in 1995, I'm already colleague with them in the prison environment. Those who are born in 2010 will become my colleagues in five or six years. This generation was born in a period where technology, it was something uh, something familiar, like going to a movie or having a Coke or ordering a pizza, yeah? So the, the technologies were not longer novel, but normal. This generation, it's thirsty for information. Uh, they even more adapt with technology and thrive to work in the collaborative environment. So when we organize, when we deliver, when we prepare training sessions, I think it's important not to be focused on the process, but to be focused on the beneficiaries of our projects. So it's important to understand when we prepare the trainings, what's guiding this, uh, what are the guiding train, uh, emerging training and development strategies for this new generation? And we go to the next slide. So. We heard and we learned that they have a different style than, than us. 30 years ago, there were no computers in my police academy. So we need to have in front of us a teacher and the teacher speak to us and we take notes in our notebooks. 
30 years after, we have a generation, the generation which is called Z generation, that learn 51% of their learning is by doing, working through examples. 38% of their uh, learning style is by seeing or reading. And just 12% of their learning style is about uh, listening in a classroom uh, uh, classroom lecture. So it is important when we organize trainings, when we, uh, pro when we provide training sessions, to have in mind that we need to keep to have to keep in mind this ratio. If I will keep them too much in the class and don't give them opportunities to interact, to share, to 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 learn by doing things, they will I will lose them and I will waste time. I will not address their learning style. So this means that we need to adapt the training strategies. So everything needs to be mobile. We expect them to be to do the most things on their smartphones from wherever they happen to be. And this is a good example of, on, of this Zoom session. We are from various countries in Europe and we interact in, an in a mobile environment. The training materials, learning management system, content management system, and other digital learning need to be easily accessible from a mobile device. Veronique mentioned the fact that the conference will be recorded and will be very easy to access via YouTube or your emails or you name it. Also, they want to find answer to problems and they prefer to watch a three minute video than read a page after page of the text. We need to learn from, from private companies. A lot of uh, private companies in Europe are pro are uh, creating learning tutorials for the new higher staff. As I said, more and more organizations are sourcing video content management that plug into their existing knowledge bases. I, I take in consideration the fact that starting uh, from next month, don't use PowerPoint uh, presentation as a tool to present my ideas and to use Prezi which is a more integrative, which is a more dynamic uh, platform for sharing information. Yeah. And to, get, to tell you a, a small story about everything mobile. Uh, in January this year, I was uh, in Turkey and I, I, I was preparing uh, a training for the judges and prosecutors on drug addiction issues uh, for the Turkey Correctional Service. And uh, when my son called me on WhatsApp, he told me what we are doing that. And I said, well, I'm preparing the assessment questionnaire. And he was asking me and how you will assess uh, the participants feedback. So I prepare a questionnaire with 20 questions and printed and delivering to them, to them. And my son told me, well, you are so old that. I said, why is that? Because there is an app. There is an application you could use, and this is why now when I am when I am 51 years old, I find that there is an application called Padlet, and since then I am a very big fan of Padlet as a tool to uh, obtain feedback uh, from the participant at a training session. So you see, it's about the learning styles, and it's about the training strategies that so that we need to adapt to the new generations. So it's me learning from a 16 year 16, 16 years old uh, child who knows better than me uh, that there are there is an app for this for this process again their their learning need to be exper exper experiential so they need to practice implementing their new knowledge and prove that they understand what they learn if I deliver a training on hostage crisis uh, situation management, if I just deliver some PowerPoint presentation and I deliver some uh, notes with do and do not when you are uh, taken hostage by an inmate and I don't put them to experiment this type of training, well, I will lose them. So simply checking a box or taking a quiz to certify they mastered a new skill is not sufficient. This is why when we grab, when we have assessment of their knowledge, we don't just give them a, a paperwork to provide. We need to to have uh, to assess them using 
various uh, um, various uh, ways. So role play and simulation, case competition, design challenges, led them to apply what they learned to solve real problems. And it's also encouraged informal social learnings. Our youngest employees will naturally want to share that knowledge with others in the organization. It is up to us to give them the tools to do that. So in order to, to provide responses to these, uh, to these uh, challenges that we are facing, I would like to speak with you about a process that we recently where that we recently finished and uh, I was partner with four prison administrations in Europe with uh, organizations like Europris, ICPA uh, and uh, labor unions and it's about the project the prison officers for the 21st uh, century the project was uh, focused on the the project was focused on uh, creating a common base of uh, of the training that we deliver to our staff that working in prison. Because right now, we need to realize that in all there are in each jurisdiction in Europe there is an each that there, there there is a different uh, training package. There is a different training uh, that is provided uh, to the staff. So. We need to, uh, in this project, we agree on the initial and continuous vocational education that should be provided to prison officers in the future regarding learning objectives, content, length of the training courses, and recognition of competencies that may foster the mobility of the prison staff through the European Union. So we create a sectorial platform working toward the prospective development of a professional role of the staff. How we work in this project. So basically it was for the first time when uh, the deliverables of the projects were not done by the only by researchers in remote areas in offices in various locations. So we put together at the same table, prison governors, first line uh, managers, prison staff, uh, super uh, sub officers from four countries. Belgium, Germany, Portugal, and Romania. And the deliverables were created by practitioners, people that are talking the talk and they are walking the walk. People that know, people that hear, smell, and see the prison environment. People that could say that, well, what you write in, in the in, in this standard operation procedure is very good on paper, but it's absolutely useless in the prison environment. So the what you will see in the in the next slides it's represent the work of these colleagues of mine from these four countries and we were for example there were a lot of moments when we say well in belgium we do like that in romania we do like that there is a difference for example uh, we let's discuss about uh, self destructive behaviors or an attempted suicide crisis how it is managed in romania in belgium well in Belgium, uh, basically, they will not intervene because you could not open the door. Uh, if you are a shift manager on a night shift, uh, you could not open the cell doors unless you don't have uh, the approval of the prison governor. And in that case, uh, in a crisis, in a self-destructive behaviors, uh, the, the first five to six minutes are important in order to solve the crisis. In Romania, for example, the shift manager, the shift manager after the governor leaves the prison at three o'clock or four o'clock p.m., is the acting prison governor. So he could take he or she could take the decision to open the cell doors and to interact and to manage the situation and, and to manage the crisis in that incipient stage. So when imagine that we have at the same table in this project, in this project, we have at the same table people with various uh, professional uh, backgrounds with various professional experience. But at the end of the process, there was a common vision on how to solve it. For Belgium, it will represent something that they need to think about 
the role and the status of the shift manager after the prison governor is leaving. Because from my point of view, the person who know better is not the prison governor who is who is at 80 kilometers away from the prison when the crisis is happened. The prison who knows better what we need to do in that moment is the shift manager who is with the eye on the site. So the process was the process was like that. We uh, develop a professional profile. What we want for uh, what we want for our prison officers to look like. What we want for our prison officers to know and to uh, to do in the prison environment. Then we, there is a set of recommendation for the uh, political dissidents on what they need to do in order to implement this vision about the professional profile of the prison gov of the prison staff, and then we create the training a training program proposals. Yeah. So some some information about this professional profile. The proposal for European prison officer professional profile, it's in uh, direct correlation with the ESCO requirements. Uh, we establish entry requirements for the European prison officers. We do a research on 25 European countries regarding prison officer initial and continuous training features. So we discuss the general introduction of the prison system, professional profile of prison officers, how we recruit the staff, what are the current skills needed for prison officers, including a development of curriculum process, training, inducting, induction training, and in-service training that we offer to the staff, and also learning methods. So we have these 25 European countries um, uh, research on the initial and continuous training. You could find more information if you look on the website www.prisonofficers21.org. Everything that I told you right now, it's available free of charge on this, on this website. So we have a library in this project. We create a library. So we have 100 resources, articles, manuals, handbooks, video, training courses can be used by trainers and trainees all around the world to search for resources and information for training. We use uh, the critical incidents as a training resource. Why we that? Why we uh, why uh, we use the incidents? Because we need to learn from the mistakes. Every critical incident, in a way or in another, that happened in a prison environment, in a way or in another. It's a mistake that we made in our professional life, like uh, professional activity. And as I mentioned in my introduction, yes, we do mistakes, and but we need to learn from that mistakes. So critical incidents are unpredictable, unplanned, and uncontrolled any uh, events. Nobody uh, predict or plan or uh, a, a crisis situation, but we could learn from that crisis situation. So this will help us to train our officer through reflective practice. And this will develop critical and reflective thinking in trainees. And critical incidents represent also a, a, a very, uh, an extremely highly interactive way of organize and deliver training to the staff. So the TPO 21 project has a, uh, the main goal was to develop a training program proposals. So the training referentials, it was developed under a bottom-up approach with PO and other prison staff. As I told you previously, four countries, for each countries, we have uh, 25 for each session. We meet in Bucharest, Portugal, Bremen, and in Ghent in order to uh, to the to work on the training referential the the training program proposal is non prescriptive can be a part of initial and ongoing training offering it depends on how much time you would like to allocate to this and we think about uh, 28 training modules and it's about 1000 
54 hours of training. Here are some uh, information how um, we structure um, how we structure the the training uh, programs. We develop also a self-assessment to support training academies to implement the PO21 training modules. So we want that all the training academies in uh, Europe to use this uh, self-assessment in order to see how they could implement or take in, consider, take, take in their attention a part of these uh, of this, uh, deliver, deliverables. Um, we will meet this, uh, I'm in close contact with uh, Europris, which is the association of the European prison services and with European prison training academies, EPTA. And uh, we agree that we will have a meeting late summer, uh, a two or three days meeting to discuss about how we could involve, how we could uh, implement some of the uh, training deliverables that we have in this project starting from 2024 in the initial or in the continuous training of the uh, of the European prison administrations. So the prison the prison officer recommendation and training proposals are non-prescriptive. Can we help those who are interested to reflect on how to modernize the training curricula of prison officers to help them face current and future challenges? This is my presentation. I would like to end the part, the introductory part, and to open the, um, the part for question and answer session to return back to Mr. Charles Dickens. So we are headed for heaven or hell, dear colleagues. Well, I believe that answer to that is strictly individual. I use the opening lines of Charles Dickens as an outline for this conversation with you. Admittedly, I took some liberties with both his words and his meanings. When he started with the positive, it was the best of times and ended each truth with a negative, it was the worst of time. I began with the negative so I could end each thought with a positive. It is what speakers are expected to do. It also allowed me to talk in a positive and optimistic terms because I truly believe that the caliber of most of working in prison and their general desire to turn prisons into corrections, into a safe and humane environment is high. I think that in spite of various social, economic, and cultural difficulties, we are making progress and will continue to do so. I do not think it will be easy, but it will be challenging and in many ways fun and exciting. The first line of the Dickens classic is immediately recognized as the beginning of his story. If you remember the last line of this book, it is a far, far better than thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest that I go to than I have ever known. May the sentiment apply to all of us. We are looked back on our work in prison environments. I wish you all of us to have an informative and productive sessions and, and with another quote from Dickens. Have a heart that never hardens and a temper that never tires and a touch that never hurts. So with this, I end my presentation session and I'm ready for the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Doreen. It's, um, can you maybe stop sharing the screen so we can see each other? Okay. Yeah. And it's really so for everyone, if you have a question, just raise your digital hand and I will give you the floor. And it's really nice, uh, Doreen, that you uh, that you quoted Charles Dickens. If I remember correctly, he was actually very critical about the prison systems himself. I don't know if you know about that history. Yes. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we see your screen again now. Yeah, no. yeah. that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Are you know about that history from Charles Dickens? Nice. Yes. Is that also why you quote him? Yeah. Partly. Okay. Um, and and I was wondering if I, I can open the floor with a question. Um, 
so the focus is very much you have been working within the prison systems uh, for a long time, of course. And I was wondering, first of all, have you seen a switch from from the the the, the way you interact with people living in prison and the people that work in prison, meaning uh, depending less on static security like cameras, um, etc., and more on relational security or like the relationship you build together within the the, the the prison system. Have you seen a change in that or? Uh, well, uh, it depends on which prison you work. Uh, I work. I start my career in a prison uh, that holds together two thousand inmates in one in in one prison. So 30 years ago, my first day of, uh, after each year of uh, faculty, I need to go as a student to work for one month in a prison uh, in Romania. So I entered in a prison where we held, we have 2,500 inmates and in one cell uh, and in one wing, we have 800 inmates. In each cell, we have 60 to 70 inmates. So you, can, you cannot rely on static security. You need to communicate well, you need to know the persons, you need to understand, and you need to cooperate with those who have under the supervision. For sure, those supervisors 30 years ago were not aware of the fact that what they were doing there in their daily operational life uh, represent elements of dynamic security. It was something for, in that moment in time, for them represents element of survival. In, the, in that harsh prison environment. As we discussed with you previously, it's cool that we discuss about dynamic security, but I must tell you that in limited, from, from my knowledge, the first line correctional officers in a remote prison in Ireland or in a remote prison in Poland and in Romania is not so well aware about these concepts. Why is that? Because in the training facility, in the training facilities, if we say we if we deliver we deliver limited information about dynamic security, but even if we deliver, we don't we deliver in an in an old classical format like we delivered 30 years ago, and not creating learning cases, don't creating uh, simulation, don't creating scenarios for them to operate. So people will write in their papers in their notebook, and that's all. Mm -hmm. But it's good. We go on conferences and we discuss about dynamic security. And it's fun and it's good. And we 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 look ourselves and people perceive, oh, this prison operate in a dynamic security context. For real. Hmm. And have you seen any differences between large-scale prisons and maybe smaller prisons or smaller units? Well, uh, smaller, smaller prisons, smaller units are better. And I, I, I see it with my own eyes when that prison, uh, when that prison uh, with 2,500 inmates go back to uh, 800 inmates, we see the level of uh, of aggressivity that disappears or, or, or decrease. We see the fact that that prison started to become more, uh, more humane than it was previously. I work for for almost 20 years. I work in the prison with 120 beds. So in this help this helped me to know even if it was a hospital and patients are coming and go, I was able to interact with each of the inmates. I was capable to know their story, to know their problems, to know when to make a joke with an inmate, when not to make a joke with an inmate, to, to know the feelings and the moods. But if you are working in a prison in a big prison with 1,000 beds. You cannot do that. This is this are this is why the recommendation to build prisons. It says that you don't need you. It's it is efficient if you build a prison with no more than 300, 350 beds, separated on wings with no more than thirty to forty inmates per wing, because this gives you the capacity to interact and to to know the person. Because as I said, from the first day when you are a wing officer, you are in charge about the life about the security, about the health, about the 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 connection with family of other 30 persons. And so it's important for you to 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 know this. Last remark by me and then I will give the floor. But 
um, one of the, the recommendations Reskill does is to have uh, about 30 people in a house or like in a facility. And you mentioned the similar, you say 30, 40 people per wing. Why is it still necessary to have this big building of 300 people? Could you also have houses in, in your opinion for when it comes to staff? Working. It's it, 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 it's it's it, it's so it's uh, well it's understandable why we still build prisons big prisons because it's cost effective yeah so imagine that when you build ten locations with uh, with thirty uh, uh, inmates in uh, per location uh, you need land. You need facilities. You need access to various uh, life support uh, systems. When you build a prison with 300, or when you build a prison, look now. Now in UK, they are building. They call it the tight Titan Supermax or Titan prisons, and there are 1,500 beds. So you need just a, a small piece of land. You build three towers, and that's all. Imagine that if you have if you use this concept. Uh, you will uh, you will need to build a lot of buildings. So the idea is good, but as long as uh, politicians are tough on crimes and they want to send much more prisons to jail, it wouldn't be extremely realistic possible to build, to develop this concept. Let's realize that right now it's much cheaper to send a mentally health inmate to prison instead of going to uh civilian hospitals so yeah yeah Thank aging you. in prison so instead i prefer an inmate who is aging in prison to get old in in a facility like you mentioned instead in a 1000 bed prisons when nobody knows about him mm. yeah, yeah? Uh, mark yeah, thank you, Veronique. My question is just related to uh, the, to, to what you just said, um, Doreen. And first of all, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Um, my question is, um, is this training program, the one you have presented, is it related to any size of prisons, small, uh, big ones, medium ones? Uh, that's the number one question. And the number two question is, are these training programs uh, remote? Um, uh, uh, or uh, do they require to to bring people in classrooms? Um, and in this case, uh, in any of those cases, uh, are, are the classes uh, held in English or uh, in uh, national languages? Okay. So the to respond to your first question, uh, as I said, the trainings could be adapted to any uh, to the context. Uh, to initial training, to continuous training, to a person who who enter for the first time in contact in contact with this with this uh, content. More of that, we uh, we prepare also recommendation. So it's it's not just the training curriculum; it's also the training methodology. So there are information for the trainers how what what icebreaker to use when you deliver this. Uh, what are the training methodologies? We recommend that you could do this a brainstorming session. You could have uh, a drag and drop uh, session of uh, of uh, of assessment. You could have a multi. Uh, you could have a, a false and uh, uh, right and uh, false uh, answer session. So this could be. It's 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 about the ingeniosity of the of the training how to, of the trainers. How will they will organize the session? The sessions, well, some of the sessions could be held remote, but when we have an, we split the uh, we, we split the curriculum, so half of them it's about practical activities. Yeah, so one time I think it's one thousand fifty eight uh, uh, hours. Six hundred twenty four is uh, tra it's training, and the half of the the, the rest is uh, practical activities. So learning by doing, blended learning is not staying in the classroom or staying in the front of a computer or so each session is followed by an application session. Yeah. So when I discuss about 
hostage crisis. Yes, it's important to know uh, for you uh, signs that in the prison could happen a new uh, crisis and what to do and what not to do when you are taken hostage. But if I don't put that in a practical in a practical stage, so, yeah, so if I don't uh, we simulate the fact that you are hostage and what to do and what not to do. I, I do this type of trainings 20 years ago and the feeling when somebody drag a balaclava on my head and tied my hands behind and I am not uh, aware about what is happening around me. It's quite, it's quite challenging. So imagine that when you speak this on the class, then we go in the in the in the in the in, the, in another room and we try to simulate this environment. So to respond to this question, also on this project, uh, I think we deliver uh, the deliverable is available in seven languages. So it's in Romanian, in Portuguese, in German, in um, various languages that my colleagues from Belgium are using. Um, in Spanish, so you will find on if you look on the you will find this uh, on the on the website. So it's mostly live session, and uh, and it's dedicated to any type of uh, size wise. I mean, uh, any type of uh, detention yeah. house. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Isabel. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, it's a very interesting way um, of improving. Uh, training and so on in the prison so um, using these technologies um, is really a sort of a, a small revolution within the prison so my first question is um, what are uh, the impacts on uh, the governance and on the organization of the prison but finally um, do you think um, it leads to a new model of prison. So that's my, my first question. And my second question is, uh, what about uh, acceptability of technology uh, by prison officers, by uh, uh, teachers and so on? Um, did you uh, identify um, breakers and how to exceed these breakers, these limits? Okay. Uh, again, I will tell you a story. Um, I believe in this, the use of technologies because 15 years ago, I was the promoter of this change uh, within in, in my prison service. And uh, I implement at national level, the e-learning platforms for uh, the prison staff and the process was uh, a little bit a little bit funny so when i entered in the prison service the romania was a communist uh, regime and uh, in 1990 we got rid of the communist regime but some of the some of the symbols of the communist regimes remain re remain in the in the prison 3 or 4 years after so imagine when i entered in the prison service to see it was called the the training notebook each each member of the staff need to have a training notebook mm. but uh we those were the previous political ideology training notebook yeah so each member of the staff in the communist regime need to have the political ideology training notebook in some of the training notebooks that my colleagues have the political ideology component was deleted with uh, with a red uh, pencil and that's all so it for me it was quite a, a shock to see that okay we are living we are not under the communist regime but we are training our staff using that 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 training that 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 old uh, old symbol and for me this old symbol determined me to think what we could do what we could do different to, to don't train our staff like we train in the communist period. So in 1997, there were only one computer in the prison where I work. And the dust on him was, I think, five centimeters thicker because nobody know how to operate a computer. But the, then the time changed. And in 10 years, 
In the prison where I work, at 120 employees, we have 70, 70 laptop, computers, laptops, you name it. Then the generation change. In, to, in, I, in 2007, when I start to implement the e-learning the e for the staff, the technologies as a tool to train the staff, all my all my colleagues are very familiar to use uh, uh, to use the to use uh, an IT uh, solution, and I don't try to push them. So I said, okay, we could do it in a in a in a in a dual way. It is mandatory for you to participate at ten days of from your free time. You are you you are paid for this participation at the training activities. So it, until until I introduce e learning, they come uh, from their free time and uh, they stay in the class. I work on my professional time. I train them, or other people train them, and we make it, it's the very old style of class of classical training format, like like you were in school. But probably it is. There are moments when they could not be in the mood for training. They are prob they could come uh, in one day and to have some issues at home and to don't be mentally prepared to accept what I deliver. So I said, you have two options. Either you could access the information that I put on the network, on the e-learning platform, or you could come, um, you could come uh, to to the training in the old classical format. And then, an important part of them use the new innovative techniques. But as you mentioned. Some of them try to hack the system. And for, for us, it was a sign that we need to send our trainers uh, to a specialized training because basically when you implement the, an e-learning platform or when you use any type of information and technology as a, as a vehicle to deliver the trainings, well, in that moment, you change the paradigm of trainings. So it's... So in that moment, we sent our trainers to a master degree course at the university on how to manage uh, training sessions uh, using this uh, IT solution. And if you remember from my from my presentation, we said that the Z generation wants to have uh, access, wants to have no more than three minutes learning tutorials or learning solutions and so on. This is a, this is an indicator for me as a trainer that if I don't check them on what they are doing at each five minutes, or if I don't interact with them, if I don't and uh, get in contact with them, I will lose. I will lose the contact with them. They will lose the, their interest on the training. So it's not just about the hard skills. Okay, create them. It's very easy to 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 develop the hard skills. Because you buy the computers, you create a dedicated uh, IT network, uh, upload the training materials, and then, okay, here it is, learn it, read it, and be smarter. It's very hard to develop the soft skills, to choose the trainer, to send the trainer to uh, a TOT on, uh, on, uh, on how to manage learning processes in 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 virtual formats, and then to put them to operate with them. One of the problems with what happens right now in Europe is that the governments are more focused on, okay, we have we use the virtual technology, we use this, we use that, but is not focused to develop the skills of those who are using the solutions and those who are managing the processes that are developed in the solutions. I I. I I see that, uh, and I see, and I face this. I face this challenge. So it's important to 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 train the trainers to this new environment. From the point of view of uh, of of, of uh, if if the, if you could face some challenge, these are the main challenges. These are these are these are the main and the most important. The fact that it's not just about technology; it's about the human touch behind this technology. Thank you. Thank you, Lorin. Um, I was wondering, is there, because we briefly spoke about how it is for, like we are always talking about a more humane environment for people that um, live in prisons. 
but it's also about people working in prison. And I know that there's a, like I mentioned, there's a research from US prisons um, that people working in the prisons in US actually live 10 years shorter than than people in US society, which is already, uh, uh, which is a very severe uh, fact, I think, and I believe. And do you know, Doreen, of any, <clears throat> is there any talk about the well-being of staff? I know that Europe is focusing on it, on the on the staff well-being um, at the moment. But is there a more general talk about like how the UK is again building a large prison? And this happens in more countries all over Europe that we keep building these large-scale prisons, and and maybe politicians can say, okay, we need to punish people, but it's not okay uh, like to to condemn people working in pres prisons also to live a shorter life. So what 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 are your thoughts about that? Well, uh, the the staff well being represent again, and I I I uh, mentioned about my organization. The staff well-being represent one of the issue that it's on the agenda of International Correction and Prison Association. And for those who are interested, I could send to you and then you could disseminate some of the researches, some of the studies, some of the presentation that we uh, have at, at our conferences is on staff well-being. I remember that we have also some projects, Erasmus Plus projects on the staff well-being. Because it represents uh, it represents a, a main topic of interest uh, for us. Because as I said in my in my presentation, yeah, people live uh, people live uh, the the, stud the studies for are for real, and we use in our uh, justification for application the researchers that the, the researches that are made uh, uh, that are made uh, in in uh, in US in Europe. I'm not aware about. Uh, uh, a European wide research on the staff well being. Right now, at European level, we are more focused on the quality of life for staff, for inmates, on the, uh, improving the condition for uh, for uh, for for inmates. I totally agree that, and I'm I'm a big supporter of improving the the condition for for inmates because when I improve the condition for inmates, I improve also the condition for staff. But we need a dedicated approach for that because. Uh, for example, I will give you, uh, I will give you some examples. Uh, working in prison for reasons that you mentioned is starting to don't be a um, very uh, desirable uh, uh, solution or uh, option. In in for example, um, in in Hungary they hire people with uh, ten grades, yeah, with ten classes, because. People with college don't apply for the positions. Yeah, uh, for the first time in Romania, uh, the positions uh, we have two hundred and fifty places, uh, and at the non-commissioned officer schools for the school with the duration of one year, and last year we don't have sufficient candidates. So instead of having two hundred and fifty, we we have just two hundred and twenty. Candidates that uh, take uh, take uh, uh, take the the positions. So it's the first time, and this this could this represent a sign that working in prison is not a desirable option like it was ten years ago, for reasons that for reasons that you mentioned. And, and probably because what I see at in the prison environment, it's you see is like a, is like a wheel. First, it happens in US, then it came to, to the islands of UK, and then it go to the mainland of Europe. So probably the that topic of staff well-being, it will start to be on the radar at European political dissidents in the next uh, five to six years. Because it happens, it's, it's, it's like a wheel, starting from prison riots, building super prison. The first who built the super prisons were the UKs. Now they started to build in York, in, 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 in UK. Also, I see in Europe, prison administration, for example, six years ago, Croatia built a prison with, um, uh, C, with, uh, with 1,200 beds for, for reasons that we discussed previously. So we have a question from Connor. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. 
Thanks, Dorian. Um, I'm just wondering because I was a prison officer for 10 years and I did the training and the training was implemented by older staff that were still employed by the prison service. So, and basically during that training, they would, uh, uh, the theology or the, you know, the theory side of it would be outlined. And then at some stages they would usually say, you know, this is the theory, but that's not really how it happens. You need to, you know, because we've done 10 years, we've done 20, 25 years of training. And even from management, that usually happened. If you come into a big prison, my first prison was Mount Joy prison in Ireland. So that was quite old. And and the management kind of encouraged us at the time to forget what we'd learned in, in college and to, um, you know, learn from officers on the job. So really my question is, have you got pushback from senior management in certain countries that, you know, it's good in theory to do this training, but implementation is different on the floor of a prison? Uh, this is why this is why the project the, the project that I mentioned about was not involving uh, people from the training uh, facilities. We involved prison governors. I also remember that when I graduated police academy, correctional section, go to work, my former deputy head of security says, "Well, lad, everything you heard in everything you heard and learned in police academy, you need to forget. This is a totally different environment." Yeah, and but we need also to learn from something from this expression, from from this from this remark. Also, also in your case, it is the fact that the curriculum that are developed by the police academy, by the uh, training colleges, prison training colleges are not updated, are outdated, and basically are taken with copy and paste from general orders from the prison service. Mm. So, with this idea in hand, we. Uh, we developed this project. And trust me, two weeks ago, I tested, and it was quite interesting. I tested some of the scenarios because in the program we have uh, a scenario, uh, some training scenarios, professionalism and friendship at work. You are, a, you are the prison governor and you have a friend who is head of section and he's doing some things which are not quite professional, what you will do. So, and people play roles. And we we videotaped these scenarios and we have a debate and everything it's related and we let people to speak not how it is written in the books, but how it is happened on the on a normal day in a prison. So this mm. is why we when we deliver, when we when we when we prepare these these uh, these documents, we were referring to to the the things that happened in the prison not the things that we write in the papers. So this is the first document that basically is based on the daily life uh, experience of the prison, starting from prison governor to frontline correctional officers. That was the idea. Yeah, what, what you what, what you, what, what you uh, mentioned, it's something that we, we are quite uh, familiar with that happens. And it's, it's a signal that in the training academies, in the training colleges, uh, we are doing uh, activities in a very bureaucratic format. So we change the type, the the typing machine with a computer, uh, but the template of but we keep the template, we keep the format of the training, we keep the information that we deliver. So imagine that it's quite. I said it's this will be this will this this represent uh, a, 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 like a moral crime, like a professional crime, to send people to work in prison. Uh, with information that you that you, that are old, twenty years old, and I strongly recommend all of you take a look. Uh, there is a there is a documentary about the um, Manchester Strangeway Prison Riot, ninety in nineteen ninety, and I think it, it it's at the at the at the in the first minute. I think it's the minute third when a prison gov uh, when a prison officer says, well. We were, uh, the training was just about purely discipline, respect the rules, follow the orders. But we were trained, and this, this I, now I quote from this person who speak in that documentary. We were trained to supervise inmates that entered in our custody in 1990 by trainers which, are, which obtained information in 1960 when they were trained by trainers who obtain information during the period of the Boer war, war. So you see, so 
people get in contact with a new generation of uh, prison population, and they have to manage this generation with knowledge which are outdated, with knowledge, with professional knowledge from 1920. So there is this 60 year difference of, uh, uh, of, uh, of knowledge affect and create what happens in a uh, strange way prison riot yeah and this is this is a common ex this is this is a common denominator of all the all the crises that happen in a prison environment it's the conflict between the knowledge the 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 context of the new of the prison population and the capacity of the of the staff to manage it if i don't empower the staff with updated present knowledge he will not be able to manage the population it's action and reaction yeah thank you thank you dorin uh, manu uh, thank you very much uh, thanks uh, first of all for the presentation dorin it's an honor to learn from your uh, knowledge and experience so thanks a lot um i have a question a small question about your opinion uh, regarding to the function differentiation that is happening now in Belgium, we are like splitting the the prison officers into two groups. We, uh, on one side, we have the detention guiders, and on the other hand, we have the safety assistants. And I'm wondering, what is your opinion about that? And is this something that also is happening in other countries in Europe? Um, and especially, I think you can compare it with warm and cold um, prison staff. Is this something that is happening a lot now nowadays uh, what the the process that you are starting uh, you are starting to implement and i remember that i have colleagues from uh, from belgium uh, from belgium uh, in this project involved uh, it's it's not so common at european level it's something that it happens just in your country you know the the the, the administration of the prison service in the Fed uh, in in Belgium know better why they take these decisions. And it's not important from my point of view. It's not important how we call the staff who work in the prison environment. It's important what we deliver to them. What what are the tools that we empower them when they interact with the staff? Because I could wear a fancy costume if I have no uh, information under that uh, under that fancy. Uh, information under that fancy costume so it's important yes basically you uh, separate it in two because one the two the main the main uh, the main uh, task for a prison service is to keep inmates in custody and to prepare them for resocialization yeah but uh, no man is an island no system is an island you cannot okay if you separate from my point of view if you separate the support staff from the administrative and security staff just to separate them uh, and to create, you see, like like uh, an island attitude. So we are the support staff. You are better than the, so the security staff or the other way around. It will create, I see that happens in my, uh, it's like the professional ego. So I work, I, I was on security and I, I like to believe about the security that is better than the other because we are, uh, bigger than the other yeah or uh, it could create on the other side well the support staff in a, like in your in your in belgium the support staff is 2000 from 10000 but you could create oh we are the look we are the lucky few those who without us the system could not run so i think you should pay attention to this uh this uh, uh processes of creating islands within the system and also what you what is the main idea you want to if if the main idea is just okay i want those guys to be extremely professionals on this area and to do only this activity because uh it's important to professionalize and to specialize the staff in one dedicated area i i i'm afraid about people who know everything or who can do everything if the main idea is that okay we want to specialize and to professionalize in this dedicated area it will be a good approach it's important not to forget to keep the channel of 
cooperation communication with the others because otherwise it will become two islands and each of them will believe that I'm better than the other. Okay, thanks. Um, Doreen, for me, last question. Um, do you know on a European level, you there's the European Penitentiary Training Academy, of course, and is there any awareness about uh, different different uh, um, training modules or training courses in different countries for people working in smaller scale settings? Because I know I know Belgium is, for example, now uh, developing the 15 houses or implementing the 15 houses. Uh, in Scotland, they have custo custody units. Uh, in the UK, they are they are currently changing also uh, into um, smaller scale settings. So, and in Netherlands, for example, as well, uh, prison staff that used to be working large scale prisons now working in smaller scale settings. But what I hear from the training academies on a national level is that they have some courses, but it's not, there's no general awareness on a European level that it's also a very different way of working. So do you know of any awareness on a European level at EPTA or Europris and what to do? There is no general, there is no general awareness about this topic. And as you don't, you don't, you don't need to be upset on this. That because you need to realize there is no general awareness uh, at training level about how to deal with aging inmates in, pri in prison, how to deal with mental health inmates in prison, how to deal with radic uh, uh, how to deal with um, uh, inter uh, with uh, minority groups in prison and so on. Right now, in the training facilities, we are they are delivering. Uh, that type of training, how to supervise, how to manage the middle of the road type of inmate, but but due due to the due to the challenges that we face as uh, in the, in the prisons, we started to raise the issue of mentally health inmates. We start to raise the issue of aging in custody. We start to raise the issue of minority groups that we have in our custody, and it's important for staff to to receive training about these topics. So it's about you and. The, the 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 activities that you will do in the future to raise the awareness. I could put you in contact with representatives of EPTA of Europris to promote your idea. I could kindly uh, invite you also to come to Antwerp to have a meeting, a discussions with some of the uh, decisions that will be present there. Because yet yeah, it's important to 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 give a signal that you are alive and kicking and you are. To be present on the map, on the map, because you need people, the staff who work in these type of environments need to receive a dedicated type of training. If I train this staff in the same manner that uh, I train the staff who work in a one thousand bed institution, it will not be efficient. Yeah. Yeah. So I we'll like remain in contact after. We'll remain in contact after this convert with this uh, presentation, and I'll give you some some info support info on this, okay? Yes, and everything you mentioned during the presentation, please send them uh, to me so I will share them with the whole group as well in a okay. in a CC. That would be very well valuable. It's, uh, yeah, like, like Manu already said, it's an honor to hear your uh, thoughts. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>